Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Landcare Conference 2021. To all participants, please submit your questions uh, to the question box that you see on the screen. Now, I would like to introduce Anna Rubio from Hornsby Council and Simon Dunn from the North Sydney Council. Now, over to you, uh, Simon and Anna, and you can start your session. Thank you very much. So, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present as part of this great conference. Um, as part of, um, as a member of Hornsby Council, Shire Council, I would like to start by recognizing the traditional owners of the land of Hornsby Shire, the Darag and Guringai peoples, and pay respect to their ancestors and elders, past and present, and to their heritage. We acknowledge and uphold their intrinsic connections and continuing relationships to, to country. Secondly, I would like to highlight the diverse team of experts contributing to this project. As you can see from this list on the slide, there are uh, names that correspond to Hornsby Council staff, but as well, it, there was amazing collaboration with Bush Care volunteers. And within Hornsby Council, we actually work across different disciplines. So uh, we work with staff from the nursery and we work as well across uh, bushland and estuary officers. So the main goal of our project was to learn how to propagate mangroves, but this was not triggered by an environmental disaster, which is great news. In fact, in the lower Hawks tree, we have an extensive healthy canopy of mangroves. Saying that, there are a number of aspects putting some pressures on our local mangroves, and these are like increased number of boats impacting the riverbanks, localized hailstorms, floods, dam releases, um, and then estuary foreshore development. And we also know that there will be any other threats popping up at any time. And this is the reason why this team decided to be proactive and to come up with a way how to propagate mangroves since they are quite important for our coastal ecosystems. So this map um, shows in green the canopy of mangroves along the Hawkes Free Estuary from Wiseman Ferry at the top to the mouth. The figure also includes the typical salinities um, as shown in the red squares. So we have 35 parts per thousand PPT at the mouth, all the way up to five parts per thousand if we go upstream to Wiseman Ferry. The estuary also offers diverse soil types. So from sandy to really thick anoxic mud, uh, different wave conditions, uh, wind, environmental conditions, that everything um, got factored in as part of this project. In the Hawkesbury, we have two mangrove species. We have the gray mangroves and the river mangroves. The gray mangroves, Avicennia marina. This is a species that prefers salty environments, uh, 35 parts per thousand, which is what, you know, what we have at the mouth. But saying that, we do find them as well in the upper areas, but in less densities. Gray mangroves drop their seeds in our area between October and December. The seeds have really high, uh, large sizes covered by a buoyant outer husk, which means that allows them to float away with the winds and the tides. Um, the, the size of the seed then means that allows them that as soon as they drop off the tree, they develop really quickly, uh, the root system. And as soon as they find the right environment to anchor, then they develop and they produce the beautiful seedling. This mangrove species is a pioneer species which tend to like disturbed areas. On the other hand, we have the river mangrove, Agiceras corniculatum. Um, this mangrove species prefers lower salinities between fresh water to 15 to 20 parts per thousand. Um, the seeds are much smaller, as you can see on the, on the screen. Um, they are not buoyant, so they tend to sink very quickly. And for this reason, we believe that they don't spread that far away from where they drop off the tree. Little information is known about their seed development, except for the viviparous adaptation, which means that after flowering, 
the seeds germinate while still attached to the parent tree. This allows the seedling to go um, to have a bit of a head start um, when the seeds fall into the water and disperses to new areas. So on the, sc on the screen, you can actually see um, some of the seeds germinating. And some of you might not have seen this because of, because of what we just said, as soon as they drop, unless you're in a protected area, you might never see the germinating seeds uh, in the environment. So um, we, we are, as part of this project, we work with both types of mangroves, the gray mangrove and the river mangrove. But the river mangrove is more fiddly and more challenging to propagate. And there is other groups doing gray mangroves, and this is why we are focusing this presentation just on the efforts and on the learnings on how to propagate river mangroves. As part of this project, we try a lot of different methods on propagating mangroves, river mangroves, from seeds and from cuttings. And we did this in the field and at the nursery, at the council nursery. I'm going to present very quickly the key points. If you want to replicate what we did in the field, what do you need to do to be successful? So remember to keep that seed has gone. We started taking it off and the performance was not as great. So leave that on. As well, do not bury the seed in, in the soil. Just leave it on the surface of the body mix and it will make its own way into the soil when the roots are developed. The trials that we left in the sunlight grew much better as well. Most of um, our trials perform better when we use really a black thick mud and using the right pot size was important. And even using protected areas within the estuary as nursery sites, um, the small pots kept floating away as they lost connection from the ground at high tide. And hence, even if or you need to secure them or to use bigger pots. Working in the field means we can control everything. And this is the reason why we look into how to do this at the nursery. And that's what Simon is going to be talking about. Um, but in the field, we know that crabs love mangrove ecosystems. And if they love mangrove ecosystems, means that they love as well our field trials. And as you can see from this plot, uh, from these figures, sorry, um, crabs were very good at burrowing in our pots, which meant that if we were using smaller pot size, we were losing a lot of soil with, um, with the tides losing a lot of the seedlings. Another thing that we also figure out is there is something out there that likes chewing on baby mangroves. And this applies to both species, um, especially if the, if the seedlings were between three and six months old. Um, we know that possums could be one of the options because we had an unexpected visit at the nursery that actually <laughs> chewing a few of our trials. So despite of the salt content in, in mangroves, yeah, there is a number of species out there that likes chewing them. So obviously you can protect your, your trials, but this is something that you need to do because once they get extremely damaged, they don't tend to develop. We, we try to see if they would recover and it's really hard. And the other thing that we experienced was that in, as like in any waterways, you get like microalgae blooms of, or seaweed blooms, as you can see um, on these figures on the right. And, and this was, if they, if they are filamentous, when it's high tide, the, the, the microalgae, it's like hair. So it's floating and it's not a problem. But as soon as the tide drops, it means that it just smooths all the pneumatophores and the seedlings. And if it's summer and 45 degrees, you tend to overheat those seedlings and lose a lot. So this is something else to deal with and when, you're, when you're working in the field. But now I'm going to give Simon the word to talk about what we did at the nursery. So we wanted to use readily available facilities that are working nursery, such as fresh water irrigation, crop tunnels, and growing procedures already used at the nursery. To grow the river mangroves, two types of propagation was used, which was growing by seed and by cuttings. The first step for the propagation by seed was collecting the seed. This was done in April when the seed was ripe, typically on the ground and having a root starting to sprout. The best results came from a seed raising mix of 50-50 river sands and cocoa peat with native fertilizer 
and using vermiculite as a cover. Next slide, please. We grew them in a propagation tunnel with overhead misters, heated benches, and basic control on humidity and light lighting. We also directly sowed into tubes and later tested this against the process of tubing up. This was to, to establish if root disturbance was to be an issue. Potting up proved to be an okay procedure. Next slide, please. The other method of propagating river mangroves was done via cutting. Basically a method to clone the plant, carrying forward ideal characteristics of a mother plant. After obtaining approvals, various types of cuttings were tested. And the most successful type of cutting was when old growth was present. The cuttings were treated with root growth hormones and inserted into jiffy plugs and placed on heated benches. The cuttings can take three to six months to strike or grow roots. White small roots must be present for the cutting to survive, um, minimizing its shock. Next slide, please. Once the cuttings and seedlings were ready, we then tubed up into larger pots in order to get them ready to plant in the field. Best results were found to have a 50-50 potting mix of estuary mud and estuary mud, watering with estuary water once a week, and the one thing to note is that they are incredibly slow growing. Next slide, please. We found the average growth of our seedlings at the nursery and in the field was 80 millimeters in one and a half years. The nursery plants did tend to be larger, however, showed slight nutrient deficiencies. Seedlings in the field tended to be darker green in color, suggesting that nutrients in the water or microbial activity in the growing media needs to be present. Next slide, please. The next steps from here are to continue to grow stock plants in the nursery setting to be able to collect more viable cutting, maybe create a how to grow manual and continue to grow the river mangroves uh, to trial methods of planting in the field. Next slide, please. We have also produced some amazing short videos that are available for you to watch at Hornsby Shire Camp on Hornsby Shire Council's YouTube channel. You may find out something you didn't know on our smelly friends and be able to get a closer look at our findings on a helping hand for mangroves. Next slide, please. All of this would not have been possible without the grant funding from the Australian Government Communities Environment Program, the dedicated volunteers that gave their time and passion to the project and the skills provided by the staff at Hornsby Shire Council and our beautiful community nursery. A big thank you to all and any further questions that don't get answered today, please feel free to email us. Thank you. The last thing I wanted to say is that this project, we will not have been able to do it without the funding from the Australian government's community environment uh, program which actually is what it really, we've always wanted to do this, but this having the funding is what it really triggered, you know, our, our work in this field. So this is it. And um, we are happy to take any questions. I think I need to stop sharing now. Yeah, cool. Okay, no worries. So <laughs> let's, let's answer some questions. So it was a fascinating uh, presentation. Thanks very much. I didn't know that mangroves grow so slow. And so, okay. The river so, mangroves. And yeah, yeah. The, the river the, mangroves. The okay. gray mangroves grow much faster, so it's okay. easier to deal with them. But yeah, okay. yeah. The river mangroves are very, very slow growers. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Now, the question we've got from Emma here is, it's actually a comment. Fantastic that Hornsby Council staff are being proactive rather than waiting for die-offs and disasters to learn how to propagate and revegetate mangroves so that's more of a comment it is question. and i and i think no i think yeah she's right it's important because there's been a lot of losses of mangroves in the northern territory and in other places for different reasons so and they are very important yeah cool the next question we've got from claudia great presentation are you planning any long-term monitoring of your field planting do I go, Simon? Yeah, Anna. Um, yes. So the ones that we put on the ground, they are all beautifully tagged 
and the idea is to keep going and to know because yeah we are at the stage in which we put them in on the ground in may and we check them out in july and they were all beautifully going but yes uh we are going to keep going collecting data and to see how they do okay fantastic okay that's it for now but we the questions might come up as we speak because people are typing now <laughs> i i might ask question then yeah. and the question would be uh for example i heard that sorry i read an article hang on uh question from the audience uh, from uh, Stephanie. Beraura Creek has great mangrove and salt marsh communities. I'm so glad to see that Hornsby is focusing on them. Are you doing any salt marsh propagation? Well, that's that's the next step, probably. <laughs> but definitely, if you go down to Crosslands, you will be able to see our little baby mangroves. Um, but yeah, we've been working with national parks and fisheries. And obviously, salt marsh is as, as important as mangroves, so they, there is interest in doing that. But Simon, do we, are, do, we do salt marsh species at the nursery? No, not yet. Mm. We're just, we just got uh, the river mangroves there. Yeah, okay. Cool. Now, we've got a question from Anonymous. How did you choose your field locations for planting? We are, oh, sorry, were any particular characteristics taken into account? Well, as I said, because we don't really have an issue in our area, we, we were more interested on the how to propagate them. Um, but yes, definitely, we, we've been told in conversations with fisheries, don't try to obviously put mangroves where they don't exist. Maybe they did exist in the, in the future, but consider what other vegetation is there and you know, like what is the implication of, of putting mangroves there. Um, but as as we were saying, no, Simon, the soil, it's probably if you're if you're thinking about putting them on the ground, we found that if you have really thick anoxic, stinky soil, um, that was the best. Because <laughs> I think it has a lot of nutrients and a lot of decomposing material. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, now Martin is asking. Great work, guys. How far of the Hawkesbury River does the river mangrove occurs, or what is its spread? Do you want to go, Simon? Or? No. You, yeah, you I got uh, Yeah, sorry, because Simon is in the nursery normally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they go. Yeah, they go in in well in the different arms. They will go up to the tidal limit, more or less. Um, so I don't know how to answer that question, but we are happy to share the maps. I mean, the maps are available from fisheries online in the fisheries web portal. Um, is that kind of what Martin was asking? Um, yeah, so they, they, but we do find them all the way as well to the mouth. I mean, river mangroves are everywhere. It's just that there is less density closer to the mouth, but more mangroves further on upstream. Okay, cool. Now, we don't have any questions now, but uh, they'll come up. Basically, I read an article which says that, which said that mangroves are able to capture five times more CO2 than, than any other, maybe not any other, but uh, trees, forests. So do you That's see right. from your perspective that they are on the same footing as trees, reforestation, as mangroves? Is this knowledge or this scientific fact is it being uh, understood or what's your yeah, perspective on this? It is understood and we talk about it about that in one of our videos so you need to watch them uh, but yes yeah. they are amazing carbon sequestrators and these days there's a lot of effort this is why these kind of projects are important because um, propagating mangroves where they are not you know where they've been damaged is important to get them back because of the amount of carbon that they can sequester at the moment, the literature varies between double to five times to, you know, they they are known to be, yeah, much more efficient carbon sequestrators than, you know, land land species of trees or, you know, like, so, yeah. And, and they can be used as, you know, mitigate, is it like a mitigating tool for climate change? So I'm hoping that at one yeah. point, a lot of people are, putting a value to these ecosystems and there will be a lot of effort for this work to 
you know, to happen yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. Now let's say that, you know, how the coral reef, how the coral reef is in strug struggling because of climate change and pollution and all that stuff. I'm sure, of course, you know that now what happens is, uh, as you probably know as well, that the, the efforts to regrow the coral uh, artificially on these structures, whether they concrete or stainless steel, whatever. Now, do you think that uh, mangroves would also require something like that, like this artificial regrowth of mangroves, or do you see that happening, or is it not not gonna? We don't need to worry about it. I'm going to leave Simon now because this is more. <laughs> I yeah, I don't think that we need um, so much the artificial platform to grow mangroves on. Like it's there will be site challenges, I believe, when. You know, you have exposed sites, disturbed sites, especially with the river mangroves being quite um, fussy with their growth. Like the grey mangroves may be okay as a pioneer species, but, um, you know, the river mangroves may need some type of structure, but that's part of, you know, what we plan to do is test um, how, how to go about planting them yeah. and the best ways to do it. Yeah, cool. And do you think that because of the impact of climate change, we will see mangroves moving further south? Mm. Or is it already happening? I don't know if it's happening, but obviously they're tropical, subtropical, but you know, go, how far do they go as far? Do they go up to Wollongong or what's the southernmost limit? Well, it depends on the mangrove species. So okay. this is where, as you move along the coast, there is different we here we've spoken about two mangrove species yeah. gray and and river yeah and almost in the north as soon as you get to uh wallace lakes posters you already have a second, a second right. another species taking over or working or living within yeah the same as if you go south but both of our species that we've been talking about they occur um in new south wales well, the river mangrove, I think, is from the Tweeds to Marimbula. So it's not the full New South Wales, but so more, okay. than, more than migration because of climate change, which it could happen, we, what we are going to have, and it's happening in some areas, is with sea level rise within an estuary. Oh, of course, so with yeah. sea level rise, the mangroves tend to take over the salt marsh, which tends to live behind it. And if we, there is not enough space on the landscape for the salt marsh to migrate, if we leave and we put a seawall or something means that the, you know, the they salt marsh grow. will get smaller. Well, the mangroves are going to keep going because they are faster growers and, you know, and they are going to take on, on salt marsh, which is as good in terms of carbon sequestration and everything as mangroves. Right. So both, you know, both ecosystems yeah. need to, we need to allow both of them to be able to migrate in this situation. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, and what are the healthiest colonies of mangroves in Australia <laughs> is do you know like do we know actually I don't know if in the if... Hawkesbury River no, no, of course <laughs> hey. <laughs> doesn't surprise me um... sorry sorry I've got we've got a question from the audience uh, I just want to make sure it's people get answered Chris is asking are there any introduced species which are affecting mangroves in the Berara Valley area <sighs> I, we, I guess, not that I know of, but we have, we want more, we are at the process that we are updating the current um, canopy layer of mangroves, the same as all the vegetation. So we will know once we finish doing that kind of work with our partners from fisheries, um, whether there's been a reduction or an increase, you know, or whether, but not that, no, Simon, not that we know specifically yeah, yeah. of any, no. yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, that was our last question here. So, and we kind of on time, we have a last kind of 30 seconds. So yeah, uh, would you like to, do you have some final comments or? I think we would like to, if we have time, just to acknowledge once again, our beautiful volunteers, because seriously, these would not have been possible without them. And they are amazing. And we have so many in the Horns Bichar working in bush care groups and as part of the award won in floating land care. <laughs> um, the nursery as well. Yes, and the nursery, exactly, Simon. So without their work, 
and their hours and you know mm -hmm. all the time in the mud with us this would not have been <laughs> yeah. would not have been possible so we yeah that's that's something that i would like to highlight right simon yeah big awesome fun. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks very much. It was really exciting and so important. I love mangroves. They're very important for the environment, to the environment. So thanks very much. And yeah, uh, we'll see you next time. And for all the participants, the next session kicks off in five minutes. So yeah, cool.